Well, the Black Arts and Cultural Center helps develop potential and creativity in Amer African Americans in the Kalamazoo area. So joining us to tell us how you can get involved in the organization is Sydney Davis, the executive director of the Black Arts and the Cultural Center of Kalamazoo. Good morning, Sydney. Good morning. How are you? We're doing pretty well. Thanks so much for being with us. Let's first talk about the organization and what happens there. Yeah, so Black Arts and Cultural Center has been around for 34 years, and we often have programming for artists in the community to develop themselves, to learn about opportunities happening um, locally and beyond nationally to take advantage of. Uh, that goes through business building workshops. Then we also have community events, such as our largest one, which is the Black Arts Festival that happens every year in a park with vendors and music and artwork happening, although this year it's virtual online. Uh, we do Kwanzaa celebrations, monthly art exhibits featuring local artists between Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, and Battle Creek. And we also regularly do quarterly film viewings and talkback discussions and um, theater programming. We have our own division called Face Off Theater that puts on amazing productions, youth shows, they feature local playwrights and cast it locally um, as well. And we do that quarterly as well through our programming. Yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a lot going on too. <laughs> so how can people get involved with that and take part with you guys? Yeah, so we always look for one volunteers to kind of help with the theater production and help with the Black Arts Festival and Kwanzaa celebration on a regular basis. These are our more bigger programs, but also we offer a membership. People to actually make an annual commitment to support the BACC it means you get to attend our events. You get first access to all the programming that we do. And we offer this uh, for business uh, memberships and personal family, individual, collegiate and artist memberships. That is the strongest way you can support the BACC, but also be involved and be very ingrained in what we do. Sydney, have you guys changed any of anything that you've done uh, in the past, uh, especially in light of the things that have been going on lately? Have you changed the way you operate or things that you're doing? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the big things is our Black Arts Festival. It happens July 10th through the 12th. And this year it's completely online, right? So it's how do we provide entertainment and art in a virtual sense? So uh, we decided to use this time to do like a virtual conference for more education or actually um, in light of recent protests and things that have been going on, we did a large call to action from our allies, our community, to really put their money into the community and support organizations like Black Arts and Cultural Center. And for the Black Arts Festival weekend that's happening virtually, we're taking those same donations and uh, doing a pitch competition for artists and Black-owned businesses and putting our donated dollars back into the community to those who need it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, Sydney, thank you so much for joining us this morning and sharing. We yeah, appreciate thank it. You. Mm -hmm. All right, 729. Here's a look at what is still ahead. It literally takes everything from you. Um, there was a point in time that I couldn't eat, sleep, or go to work without asking heroin's permission. He's a former addict who got a second chance at life and overcame his addiction. How he's using his experience to inspire others. And controversy over swimming lessons here in West Michigan. Why neighbors are fed up, plus why instructors say this woman is simply just trying to save lives. And say good morning to our Facebook fan of the day. It is Angela McKinney. Angela, thanks for being a part of Fox 17 Morning News. Have a great weekend. You're watching Fox 17 Morning News with Mike Avery, Deanna Falzone, Anthony Dommel, and Rob Westaby. That took me a little bit, but I uh, <laughs> finally made one. <laughs> it's impressive in the music, the buildup. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Ken, our editor, doing that this morning, I believe. <laughs> Put that music in there. Your daughter took that video, yeah, too? Yeah, so Jenny took the video, and she, I, mean, I must have missed probably these six, seven times. And that's not bad. Had to chase the ball outside the fence of the pool probably <laughs> six times. So I got a little workout in just trying to nail that one, but I finally yeah. got it, so yeah. it's fun. Yeah. It's a beautiful day for it. 
I know one of our viewers commented on our video and said that you, you accomplished two things. One, you sank the bucket and you didn't fall in. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. It's an impressive day. Two wins. <laughs> there right, you go. You got it. <laughs> Well, we are looking at a beautiful weekend as well, correct, Anthony? Yeah, that's right, Sarah. Another uh, afternoon to get out by the pool, go to the beach, whatever you're doing. Temperatures are going to take a crack at 90 degrees here in Grand Rapids this afternoon. And we got light winds again, too, folks. So uh, this warmth, uh, you're going to feel every last bit of it as that sunshine just beats down on us. Uh, some high-level clouds will be drifting across and maybe just filtering some sun from time to time, but really not a whole lot. 64 is the latest observation at the airport in GR. We're already going to be into the low to mid 70s here by mid morning, say 9 a.m. or so. And then by midday, I think uh, 12 o'clock, as you're headed out for lunch, we're going to be approaching the mid 80s uh, already in Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo. Temperatures around West Michigan, you know, with a light winded pattern, you get very warm right along the lakeshore as well. So similar temperatures from Holland southward to South Haven today, maybe held down just a couple degrees versus everywhere else. And we've got warm air still a ways out to the west. So we got to get through today, tomorrow with well above normal temperatures. And even when we cool down on Sunday, it's not going to go dramatically cooler. Lower 80s at that time. Winds and gusts around the region right now, they are very, very light. Those winds will pick up slightly here out of the southwest by late morning and for the afternoon. A general southerly flow, not surprising since there's an area of high pressure to to our east and an approaching cold front. So in between, we've got the squeeze play. We're dry right now and uh, going to maximize our warming with abundant sunshine today. We don't have anything to track in terms of showers or thunderstorms and no surprises on tap for today. If there was going to be a surprise with a pop up shower, that would be tomorrow afternoon, though I think the bulk of any rainfall does hold off until the overnight and into Sunday morning. I'll have more on that to come and an up and down pattern into next week. We got some changes ahead. Stay tuned forecast. It's coming up. In Fox 17 traffic, the usual places where we start to get a little sluggish when it comes to traffic speeds, mainly in the freeways in construction, and it's eastbound 196 at Lake Michigan Drive, and then after Fuller Avenue. Those are the spots that are problematic. Now, later tonight, even with light traffic, you may get some slow traffic uh, after uh, 7 o'clock tonight, and this will be after 8 o'clock as well. Double lane closures on 131, northbound between 44th and 28th, southbound between 36th and 44th. And I say it's overnight, but it's going to hang in. Uh, the lane closure will stay until noon tomorrow. So if you're going somewhere in the morning tomorrow, you may have your traffic travel interrupted. Same sort of thing if you're in the east of Ada on the uh, east side of the Grand River on M21. Uh, not only last night, but through the weekend, starting at around 7 or 8 tonight, lane closures in both directions and going around the clock through the weekend. Remember, 68th Avenue Bridge closed in your detouring. Uh, it's just south of Eastmanville over the Grand River. Using Lake Michigan Drive, Linden Drive, and Leonard. I'm Rob Westaby, Fox 17 Traffic. The family of a 19-year-old girl says that she died doing something that she had done her whole life, trying to help out others. Jasmine Patterson drowned in Lake Michigan earlier this week, but not before getting her four-year-old cousin to safety. The pair went underwater Tuesday while using an inflatable at the beach in South Haven. Jasmine was able to push her cousin to safety, but used all of her energy in doing so. And that's when her sister says that she called 911. A good Samaritan on a boat brought Jasmine back to land where after she was airlifted to Kalamazoo, her family says she fought to stay alive, even as things look bleak. And she fought the whole night and morning. So she was definitely a fighter at mm -hmm. 19 years old. She was a hero, and I think about that all the time. Mm -hmm. And as as hard as this is, this is to believe that it's true, you know, we can't bring her back. Um, but we have tons of memories of her, and we can always remember what she did when she was here. Jasmine's family says they're thankful for the kind stranger who helped bring her back to shore, even if those efforts didn't ultimately save her. Now they say they're focused on remembering her as a selfless person that she was. And a Calhoun County man has been charged in the death of a missing woman. Yeah, 25-year-old Jose Juarez was arraigned in yes, uh, yesterday afternoon on a murder charge in the death of Allison Sargent.
The Calhoun County Sheriff's Office shared evidence during a press conference an hour before the arraignment saying that Sergeant's body was found on March 7th on East River Road by someone out for a walk. A few days later, her car popped up in Detroit. When detectives issued the arrest warrant for Juarez, he was already in jail on an unrelated charge. Juarez was also charged with felony firearm and mutilation. He also has four prior felonies on his record. It is 739. We'll see you right back here after a quick break. Now more than ever, we need to hear the stories of hope, and that's exactly what this is about. That's right, a man's story about overcoming addiction, getting a second chance at life, and how he's using his experience to inspire others. Deanna Falzone joins us live with how he is beating the odds. Good morning, Deanna. Good morning to the both of you. We actually sat down with Santos Castro a few months ago before the pandemic started. And there's just some people that you interview and their story just sticks with you. It's just so moving and powerful. And that's the case here. And I think that you'll agree. And it's so easy to go back to it. It's always going to be waiting there for you. But that's why you have to keep fighting every day and, you know, improve your life. I always tell everyone, I don't care what your age is, your race, your gender. It's never too late to improve your life. Sitting down with Santos Castro to hear his story now and looking back at his last mugshot show a hard fought journey of recovery, perseverance and hope. I actually, I was short two credits of graduating my senior year. Oh, yeah, two credits. Um, and then also my attendance fell off because I was living a drug lifestyle, hanging out with the wrong friends, missing school, skipping school. And that just it snowballed mm -hmm. just into to the point to where I started catching the law enforcement's eye. They started knowing who I was on a regular basis. And from there, things only spiraled. Santos eventually became addicted to heroin. It literally takes everything from you. Um, there was a point in time that I couldn't eat, sleep, or go to work without asking heroin's permission. From 2014 to 2015, he went to jail more than 15 times. It's very hard work to be an addict. It's very hard work to figure out who I'm going to steal from. Eventually, that caught up to him. And the last time he was arrested, he wasn't headed back to jail. I knew I was going to prison. And because the system's just, they had enough of me. There's only so many times you can go to jail before they finally slapped a gavel on you and say, hey, you're, we're putting you away for a while. A sort of relief came over me when I was finally in handcuffs. Really? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because I was tired of running. I was tired of feeding the dragon that would always win. I was tired of being a slave to the addiction of uh, intravenous use of heroin. Santos was off to prison for two years. I was just very, very fearful. That's when I actually talked to the jail chaplain. I did what every brave man should do when it comes to that point, ask for help. Mm -hmm. And I asked the chaplain to, uh, to help me, and he, that's when he gave me some advice and told me to make my prison uh, term profitable. And he did, more than profitable. He made it life-changing. So when I got into prison, hey, I have the opportunity to get my GED. I also learned a new trade in there. Meanwhile, all, during all this, there's another route you can go in prison. You can definitely sharpen your criminal skills in prison. But I chose to better myself, to um, sort of prepare myself when I am reintroduced into society. The odds of Santos falling back into his old lifestyle was high. Nearly 80% of inmates end 